Hello and welcome to our Lenten webinar retreat and it is day 33. So I welcome you to the next few minutes, a time of soul searching, a time of reflection and a time of just reawakening your heart to the Christ, the one who bore all our guilt, shame, sin on a cross out of love. And first, I'm guided to read to you a reflection from the Little Book of Lent, and it's from Pope John Paul I. You may not have known about this Pope, but interestingly, when I was a nursing monk, we just fell in love with him. He had the most enigmatic smile. And then, of course, within 30 or days of his papacy, he was found dead. And I found that very strange at the time. But let's, let's just read about him. He was born in 1912. And after several years teaching theology, he was appointed Pro Vicar General of Belluno in 1948. And then 10 years later became Bishop of Vittorio in Veneto in Venice. In 1969, he became Patriarch of Venice, and on the death of Pope Paul VI, was elected Pope in 1978, a position which he held for just 33 days before dying from a heart attack. While Patriarch of Venice, he wrote a series of letters, which were originally printed in an Italian newspaper, addressed to various individuals, some fictional and historical. This is an abbreviated extract from the letter he wrote to Jesus. But interestingly, I always felt, and this is a personal view, that something more sinister happened to him. And I'm reading this book in God's Hands by David Yallock, an investigation into the murder of Pope John Paul I. It makes good reading, and it's not prefabricated, because the author, David Yallock, is an incredible journalist and he only writes truths, but it took him three years. And all my own suspicions were confirmed because he highlighted a corruption within the Catholic Church, especially in the Vatican, with various bishops who were laundering money for the Mafia, which of course the Church has denied. But let's get real. The Church is made up of human people. Some are devout and holy like Pope John Paul I but others are greedy and self-centered. So let us not be shocked. Dear Jesus, I have been criticized. He's a bishop, he's a cardinal, and people have said he's been writing letters to all sorts of people, to Mark Twain, to Pigai, to Casella, to Penelope, and heaven knows how many others, and now aligned to Jesus Christ. All the same, here is my letter. I write it with trembling, feeling like a poor deaf mute, trying to make himself understood. Or like Jeremiah, who when he was asked to preach, said to you very reluctantly, Our Lord, God, behold, I cannot speak, for I am a child. Pilate, presenting you to the people, said, Behold the man, behold the man. He thought he knew you, but he knew not the least part of your heart, which a hundred times and in a hundred ways you showed was tender and merciful. Your mother on the cross, sorry, uh, your mother, on the cross you wished not to leave this world without finding a second son to care for her. And you said to John, behold your mother. The apostles, you live night and day with them, treating them as true friends, bearing with their faults. You taught them with endless patience. The mother of two of them asked for a privileged place for her sons, and you told her that it was not honours but suffering they would find with you. Others wanted the best places too, and you told them to sit in the lowest place and serve others. In the upper room you gave them this warning, you will be afraid, you will run away, you said. They protested, the first to do so, 
and the most vehement was Peter, who later denied you three times. You forgave Peter and said to him three times, feed my sheep. As for the other apostles, your forgiveness breaks out above all in John chapter 21. They had been out in a boat all night and you were there on the lakeside before dawn, acting as their cook and servant, lighting the fire, roasting some fish for them to eat with bread. Sinners, you are the shepherd who gives who goes in search of the lost lamb, who is happy to find it again and celebrates when he takes it back to the flock. You are the good father, who, when the prodigal son returns, flings himself on his neck and embraces him warmly. On every page of the gospel, you approach sinners, both men and women, eat at their table, invite yourself in, if they dare not invite you. I have a feeling that you seem to worry more about the suffering sin produces in the sinner than about the offence against God. When you gave them hope for forgiveness, you seem to be saying, you can't imagine the joy your conversation and conversion brain gives me. When Peter said to you, you are the Christ, the son of the living God, you not only accepted this confession, but rewarded it. You always accepted for yourself what the Jews believed belonged to God. They were scandalized when you forgave sin, said you were master of the Sabbath, taught with supreme authority, and declared yourself equal to the Father. Several times they tried in to stone you as a blasphemer because you said you were God. When at last they took your prisoner they took you prisoner and led you to the Sanhedrin. The high priest asked you solemnly whether you were or were not the Son of God. You replied that you were and that he would see you at the right hand of the Father. Rather than retract this and deny your divinity, you accepted death. I have written to you, but never have I been so dissatisfied with what I have written as I am this time. I feel I have left out most of what could be said about you and have said badly what could have been said much better. But there is this comfort. The important thing is not for one person to write about Christ, but for many to love and imitate him. And happily, in spite of everything, this still happens. And that was from Albino Luciani, Letters of Pope John Paul I. And he leaves us a scripture quote from Philippines 2, within 1 to 11. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. Not beautiful. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. And he shares with us a prayer. My Lord God, I have no idea where I am going. I do not see the road ahead of me. I cannot know for certain where it will end, nor do I really know myself. And the fact that I think that I am following your will does not mean that I'm actually doing so. But I believe that the desire to please you does in fact please you. And I hope that I have that desire in all that I am doing. I hope that I will never do anything apart from that desire. And if I know that if I do this, you will lead me by the right road, though I may know nothing about it. Therefore, I will trust you always. Though I may seem to be lost and in the shadow of death, I will not fear for you are ever with me and you will never leave me to face my perils alone. They, that prayer was from Thoughts in Solitude by none other than the great, the wonderful Thomas Merton. So let us just be still and put on the mind of Christ. But there is a price to pay when we put on the mind of Christ. For the mind of Christ to me represents simplicity and humility it represents a different lifestyle choice, one of truth, justice, and embracing the marginalized, 
whom society rejects. And those of us who are called into divine service, be it as rabbis, imams, priests, religious, monks, nuns, Jesus expects of us to be humble, to be chaste, and to always tell the truth. But sadly we know, and I know from my own experience in the monastery, you meet amazing monks, great spiritual giants, but you also meet the occasional monk who tries to undermine you, to belittle you. And you will always have those, what I call the enemies of your soul, who will come into your life from time to time they will mock you, belittle you, even report you, as I have been on the internet by a member of my own family, have been a con man, a person of dubious character. But we forgive, we send love, we do not retaliate with hate, we send love, and we pray for those persons who hurt us. But putting on the mind of Christ, is putting on like a new coat. You wear it with respect. You treat it well. You don't go swimming in it and you certainly don't go repairing your car with the bonnet up and getting all oil and grease on it. You treat it gently, carefully and lovingly. And so it is. I hope my words have helped you and I look forward to your company again. God bless you. Enjoy this fifth week of Lent and know that on Easter Sunday our spirit, our hearts will resurrect with the Christ. God bless. Excuse me.